If we haven't met before, my name is Adam, and man, if you're new here this morning, we're so thankful that you've chosen to worship with us this morning. Last week was Vision Sunday, and man, I walked away with my heart just so full of what the Lord is going to do through us as we humble ourselves before him, and that's really what I want to talk about today today is to the position that we really need to have. But I walked away just thinking, Lord, like, would you use us to disciple others, God? Uh, we, we talked about discipleship and uh, laying the foundation for that and how that really is the heart of God. We talked about uh, a building, that we're going to be a church that arise and builds. Just as Nehemiah said in his day, let's arise and build. And the people, it was the people, not Nehemiah. The people said, yeah, Nehemiah, let's arise and build. Let's go after it. And I believe that we are in an important moment right now in our church's history. And I believe that the Lord has us to make a greater influence in this city, in this nation, around the world. Amen. And that's really what the Lord is kind of leading us into. Uh, so this week we are starting this brand new series, Arise and Build. And this morning's message is incredibly pivotal as we approach this because how many of you know that our hearts and how we position them are, it's crucial in this next phase as we build. We've got to recognize, man, it's not about us, it's about God, it's about his kingdom. So that's what I really want to talk about uh, this morning. If you want to turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16, we'll get there uh, here in a little bit. Uh, I've entitled my message here this morning, Blind Spots, Blind Spots. Uh, if you'd like my notes, you can text notes, the numbers on the screen, and what's in front of me will be in front of you. Let's pray and let's ask the Lord just to speak to us this morning. Lord, we, uh, we love you so much, God. We love you so much, Jesus. Lord, we thank you, God, that, Lord, you sent your only son for us. That, Lord, we have hope and we have life that only comes from you. That, God, through every situation, God, Lord, through your Holy Spirit, you bring peace that surpasses understanding, God. Lord, there is joy that comes in the morning, Father. Lord, you're so faithful and you're so good. And Lord, I pray that as we open your word this morning, that God, you would speak to us, God. That Lord, each and every individual, God, as we talk about building for your kingdom, God, whether they're, we're building a business or uh, we're building a, a, a relationship with someone or we're going through a season of transition, is God, we go through building seasons in our lives, God, just as we're going through a building season in your church, God, that, Lord, we would recognize that it's never us, it's always you that can do it, God. And so, Lord, we lean into you, God. Would you show us any areas, God, where we, uh, will, what, that we might see, God, where we fall short, Jesus, so that, God, we can take care of them, Lord. We can walk in your truth and your love, God. We love you so much, God. In Jesus' name, everyone said amen, amen, amen. amen. Uh, blind spots. We all have them. I've got them. <laughs> You've got them. We've all got some blind spots in our life, whether it's in our job, in a position, even in our sin, we have blind spots. Uh, one blind spot that you might have is there's this idea going around you could call it a conspiracy theory that the reason why the Chiefs are in the Super Bowl right now is because of Taylor Swift somehow. And I just wanted to say to you, if you think that way, you've got a blind spot. Because the reason why they're in the Super Bowl, y'all, is because they have the best quarterback on the planet. His name is Patrick Mahomes. That's why they're in the Super Bowl, not because of Taylor Swift. People give her way too much credit. And if you believe that, you've got a blind spot. I'm kidding right now. Partly serious. But more on a serious note, the church it has a blind spot. There's a discipleship crisis happening and going on in the church today. There's a study by Barna that says that 63% of people in America call themselves Christians. 63%. But only 4% of the 63% are actual disciples and followers of Jesus. Only 4% of the 63%. I don't know about you, but that's pretty an alarming statistic. The church has a blind spot. 
And we're aiming to correct that within our own body, amen, that we would be disciples, as we talked about last week, we would be disciples that what? Make disciples, because you're not a disciple unless you make disciples. In the coming weeks, we're going to give you some practical application for making disciples. But in order to overcome blind spots, you first got to recognize them in order to grow. And as I said before, every single person in this room, to a certain degree, you've got a blind spot somewhere. A blind spot with even our sin. And so this is what we got to recognize is we're entering in a season of building corporately as a church, but maybe you're entering a season of building as an individual. You're building a business. You're building something else in your life. That it is never us. It is always God. Let me put it this way. God doesn't use us because of us, but he uses us despite of us. It's coming to a recognition that, God, I am literally nothing without you. It's understanding the depravity of our hearts, the depravity of mankind, that we have to have the Lord, that there's nothing outside the realm of Jesus and his kingdom that is worth anything else, and we can't achieve anything outside of him. It is only the Lord. It is only through Christ. It is only through giving our life to him that we can ever do anything significant for him and for his kingdom. But it's kind of tricky here, y'all, because we got to recognize and understand that it's Jesus working through us, and there's nothing special about us. There's this passage of scripture that Psalm 19, and David writes this, he says, who can discern his errors? So David's posing this question, who can discern his errors? He's posing this question because there is sin in our lives that sometimes we are not aware of. And that's why we must realize that sanctification is really a process. It's a process that will never arrive here on this earth that when we come to realize, man, that we don't have it all figured out yet, that then that's when God can use us. So he says, who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent of my hidden faults. You know, there's a level of ignorance in our own lives of our own sin. And David is worried here about his hidden faults. But look, look at this next verse 13 here. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. In other, in other words, he's, he's concerned about the sins that are hidden that he doesn't even know about, but he's also concerned about the sins that he commits that are also willful, that he does know about. Would Lord, would you protect me? He's making this plea, and he says this. He says, let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. And he's realizing here that just as we talked about obedience and um, rapid repentance a couple weeks back, that he's realizing that, man, there's sins and there's things that he does that he doesn't want to do. And he's saying, Lord, would you help me with this? Let me be innocent from great transgression. Verse 14, a very popular uh, scripture that that many of you know in this room. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart Be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. This is his cry. This is his plead. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Before God can use us in a greater way to build his kingdom, there's a deeper level of humility that he demands. I think about my own life, and I grew up in a, I hate labels, honestly, with the church, but this is the only way to explain it, I guess. I grew up in a very charismatic Pentecostal church, and again, I hate that label, but that's what it was, and I would get prophetic words in my life about, Adam, you're going to lead worship. Adam, you're going to be a pastor, and I'll be honest with you, when people would speak pastor over me, I'd be like, no, I don't want that. That's not going to be for me. But here I am today, I'd accept the worship pastor thing because music was fun. And I would think to myself, okay, there's something special about me. You know, early on, you get a prophetic word like that, hey, Adam, you're called to do this, you're called to make a difference for his kingdom, he's going to use you in great ways, you get a prophetic word like that, 
And all of a sudden in your own life as a young person, I would think to myself, man, there's something special about me. You ever felt that way? I remember uh, growing up, you know, the famous song, I'm going to be a history maker, that delirious song. I don't know if you remember that at all or not. Uh, but I would sing that song, I'm going to be a history na- maker in this land. And the thing, the very thing that got me to walk into my destiny was also the very thing that held me back from my destiny. Because I would have this thing in my life of saying, okay, I'm special. I've got something special going on in me. And so I walked into my destiny because I had this encouragement, this prophetic word. But then what the very thing that was holding me back for the fullness of my destiny was the very thing that encouraged me to walk into it. Because I think there was something special about me. So last week as I was coming in, this is what kind of sparked this message and the heart behind this message this morning is us driving in. You know, we, ha- we have a big, huge vision here at the church. And I recognize and know that it is bigger than anything that I can achieve or you can achieve or we can do or we can even do together. It's only going to be God that does it. And that's why I love it. <laughs> yeah. That's why I love it. It's because only God can get the glory when he does it. Because it's so big and so great. And Lord, we're just saying, Lord, I want to be used by you. And so I'm having this conversation with the Lord. And I just say to the Lord as I'm driving in last week, Lord, you've got to do this despite me, despite my leadership failures, despite my shortcomings, despite who I am, God, despite, despite myself, God, you've got to build your church despite me, Father. Lord, would you just use me? And Lord, I humble myself before you as there's this transition happening, right? And it's kind of what we need to have in our own lives of, Lord, I desperately have to have you. I desperately have to have you. What makes, because we are special only when God is able to use us and work in us. And it's when we come to that certain place of humility of recognizing it's only God that can do it. Is this making sense this morning at all? I want to kind of fill in the gaps a little bit more. So, the Lord reminded me of, of, this, of this passage of scripture that's this pretty popular that pride comes before destruction, right? Pride comes before destruction. And immediately, I felt the Holy Spirit speak to my heart that humility comes before construction. Humility comes before construction. Humility comes before building. That there is a place we have to come to where we recognize and know that, Lord, I am humble before you, God. I can only do it because of you, Jesus. And now he's got you right where he wants you, and he's allowed to build through you. Because before that, you're not set up to be able to receive it. Because what might happen? You might take all the glory. And so I'm saying here at the church, God is only going to be the one to receive the glory We're going to humble ourselves before him and allow him to build. Allow him to build, him alone. uh, When you think about just people in the Bible, there's so many examples of this. Moses, what does he say? Lord, I'm nothing. (laughs) I'm literally nothing. At this point, he, uh, he probably had some pride in his life beforehand, thinking he was something special. All of a sudden, he's having this conversation with the Lord, Lord, I am nothing. And then what does the Lord say to him? Well, I am the I am God. I've got everything that you need, right? Think about Daniel. Daniel went through it as well. And then he was used for the glory of God. Jacob, same thing. He has a dream and a vision of him being a ruler over a nation and all these other things. And what does he do? He gets thrown into slavery and sold by his brothers and everything else. And then after a while, after his humility, God uses him significantly to establish his kingdom. There's a season of humility that we all really have to walk through in order for the Lord to establish his kingdom through us. Psalm 127, Solomon, the wisest man who ever walked the planet, he writes this, and this is actually one of two psalms is attributed to Solomon. He says this, unless the Lord builds a house, we labor in vain. How many know that to be true? Unless the Lord builds a house, we labor in vain. Unless we say to the Lord, okay, God, we're here, we're available, arise and build through us. Unless the Lord does it, we labor in vain. 
We've got to be people who are so desperate for him. We are often guilty of asking the Lord to bless our agendas, aren't we? Instead of saying, okay, God, where are you calling? Where are you leading us? Where are you calling us into? That's where I'm going, God. That's where I want to be. And that's where the blessing is, right? It's where the Lord is leading. So we've got to come to that place of humility. Lord, would you build your church? I want to go where he's leading, church. I want to go where he's leading our families. I want to go wherever God is at because that's where the blessing is. I uh, was quickening my heart this morning. The Lord gave me this passage for a couple people this past week who were just going through stuff. But the Lord really put in my heart Psalm 91 for the entire congregation this morning. And I wasn't planning on, on sharing of this, but this is what I, I want you to know is this, that when you go through a, a season of building, we have to be foolish not to think that the enemy is going to try to stop us. Don't we? When you're going through a season of building like we're going into, you've got to be a fool not to think that the enemy is going to try to come against us. So Psalm 91, I want to just, I really want to pray this over you, to be honest with you. But I also want to challenge you because Here's, we read Psalm 91 and we accept the promises of, of God in Psalm 91. We don't realize what it takes to get there. And so this is key. Uh, it says this, verse 1, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. But what's the key here? Verse 1, very first part, He who dwells in the secret place. <laughs> We've, we talk about this here at the church that our corporate encounters with God would lead us to daily personal encounters with God, right? That it's going to take us dwelling in that personal encounter with the Lord daily to be in the secret place. If you're not doing that, you're really taking yourself outside of these promises. Look at the promises of God as you dwell in the secret place. I will say to the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, and him I will trust. Because you've been with the Lord and you're confident in God. And so you can fully put your trust in him. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers. And under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that walks in the darkness, nor the destruction that lays waste at noonday. You shall not be afraid. I'm telling you right now, I'm just speaking over you and praying over you right now, you will not have fear. You will not have fear. You will not have fear because you're going to be established in the secret place. The secret place of the most high God. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand to your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Amen? Amen? Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Now watch this in verse, verse 9. Because you have made the Lord who is my refuge. Even the most high, your dwelling place. Because you have dwelt in the secret place. Y'all understand, I just want you to understand right now how important the secret place really is. How important the secret place really is. Not only is it for knowing God, but it's also the promises of, of Psalm 91 here. Because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place. This is the promise now. No evil shall befall you. Nor shall any plague come near your dwelling, for he shall give his angels charge over you. Aren't you thankful that God sends his angels to protect us, his warring angels, his protecting angels? That's what he does. To keep you in your ways, in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent. You shall trample underfoot. Verse 14. Here's another, another promise for this type of person. Because he has set his love upon me. When we set our love upon God, here's the promises now. Look at this. Therefore, I will deliver him. Notice that word, therefore. Therefore, I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. 
How many of you know the name of Jesus? The name above every name. He's greater than any problem, any circumstance, any situation that you're walking through or going through. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. I love that. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. With long life, I shall satisfy him and show him salvation. Lord, I just speak that over the people of Journey, God. Psalm 91, that God, as they dwell in the secret place of the Most High God, they will rest underneath the shadow of the Almighty God. For Lord, you are their protector, God. You are their defender, God. And no matter what's happening and going on in this crazy world, God, Lord, you will be with them. Not only will you be with them, God, that you will give them peace that surpasses all understanding and joy, God. Lord, unspeakable joy. That's the type of people we will be, God. Despite anything, Lord, we will walk in the fullness of you in our joy, God. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. So here's the, the, the meat of my message this morning that I felt the Lord kind of leading us to. Uh, Proverbs 24, verse 3. By wisdom a house is built, and by understanding it is established. By knowledge the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. I'm going to read that again. By wisdom a house is built, and by understanding is established, by knowledge the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. So because we have blind spots, we need to ask the Lord for wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, don't we? Because we are people who are humble, because we know that, man, there's blind spots in our life, and as we build, we need God's wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. So three keys this morning in seasons of building I want to give you. Three keys in seasons of building. Number one, in seasons of building, get wisdom. In seasons of building, get wisdom. If you're building a business, you're going through a transition period of time in your life, as we corporately build God's church, what do we need? Get wisdom. We need the wisdom of God. Wisdom is this, the quality of having good judgment. <laughs> the quality of having good judgment is wisdom. Wisdom and good judgment is letting God do the building, isn't it? When it comes to your business, work diligently, but let God do the building. When it comes to your family, love them like Jesus, but let God do the building. When it comes to your finances, give cheerfully, but let God do the building. You do your part and you trust God with the rest, amen? amen. Matthew 16, verse 13, it says this. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I am? The Son of Man. So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to him, to them, Jesus said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon, for flesh and blood are not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. We can't have wisdom without the Holy Spirit speaking to us. Verse 18, and I also say to you that you, Peter, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Listen, it's easy, very easy to be discouraged in this world today with the news happening and what's going on. But I assure you though, have great confidence because God is building his church. God is building his church. Around the world what is happening is God is raising up a standard. He is putting his heart in the heart of his people. You may look around and feel like all hope is lost, but listen, God is building his church. You may look around and feel like all hope is lost, but God is building his church. And if God built his church, no demonic principality, no power of darkness can stand against the power of Jesus. Amen? No circumstance or situation can bring it down. No war can bring it down. No politician can bring it down. It might look dark, but joy comes in the morning. God is building his church. 
On this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now watch this in verse 19. I love this part. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. When we have an understanding that God gives us the keys as we humble ourselves, I mean, there's nothing special about us, but what's special about us is God has given us the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And as we partner with Jesus and humble ourselves and be open instruments and tools to bring his kingdom here on the earth, something special happens. And no matter what weapon is formed against us, it will not prosper because God has given us the keys. Amen? He has given us the keys. God has done it through his son, Jesus, who rose again on the third day so we can have life in him, not only salvation, but fullness of life and conquering every circumstance that comes before us because of Jesus. He is our provider. He is our safety. He is our strength. He is our ever-present help in time of need. And he is looking for people to humble themselves and give him all the glory. And we will be those people. Amen? Amen. Number two, in season of building, ask for understanding. In season of building, we must ask for understanding. Because again, We've got blind spots. We may not see everything, so we need to ask the Lord, Lord, give us understanding in these situations. Verse 21, Matthew 16, from that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Verse 22, then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, far be it from you, Lord, This shall not happen to you. What a fool. (laughs) But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Can you imagine Jesus, the son of God, looking at you and saying, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Peter didn't ask questions to understand why Jesus had to go to the cross. Instead, what did he do? He rebuked him. When you don't understand When you don't understand why God has to do what he's doing, ask him why. It's understanding that I've got blind spots. Lord, I need you to to show me what are you doing here? Where are you taking me, God? where 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 are we going? I don't see it, Lord. Would you help me to understand? Amen? I've got some questions, Lord. Would you help me, Father, in this circumstance? Now watch this. Isaiah 55 is a very popular passage. We all know it. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Right? Nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, God is saying, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Here's the thing. We can ask questions. It's just the way that we, in which we ask them. Are we asking them as a child coming before the Lord? Or are we asking them arrogantly? If we have a heart posture of a child before the Lord, he is faithful. He's a good God. And sometimes we got to recognize and know that even in the answer, we're not going to understand it. Why? Because his ways are higher. His thoughts are greater. Here's what I've discovered in my life. The more I walk with the Lord and understand him, the less I understand him. (laughs) It's a paradox. The more I understand God and his ways, the less I understand him altogether. It's coming to this place of God, I don't really understand, but Lord, I trust you. And it's okay to ask questions. It's not okay to rebuke as Peter does here. We can come as a child before the Lord. Lord, would you help me understand the situation, God? Lord, would you help me understand what to do next as I'm building, Lord? Lord, would you help me to to understand where you're taking me and what you're doing and where where you're going, Father? I think of my kids. You know, as a kid, when they were younger, they... By the way, Ruth is going to be 13 on Tuesday. I've got a teenager, which is just crazy. Yeah, it's weird. She doesn't ask questions with, with, like a child anymore, but she used to ask questions like a child. Uh, Dad, when are we going to be there, right? Dad, why'd you do that? And she's asking just very innocently because she wants to know and she wants to discover. She's like four or five years old, right? And these questions come up. And I think that what's happened is a lot of times we've lost the innocence of a childlike faith because we don't want to think ourselves as a child, but we are a child of God. Sure, we are co-heirs 
with, with Christ, but we are also a child of God. And we just got to come before the Lord, Lord, as a child, would you help me to understand, amen? amen. The third thing I want to give you in seasons of building is this. Third thing is desire knowledge. Desire knowledge. How do you search for knowledge? How do you find knowledge? You follow Jesus. You follow Jesus. In this life, you will continually grow by following Jesus. It's just having this hunger and desire for his word. And you've got to let this knowledge transform you. I've said this before that knowledge without transformation is just theology, and theology is no life. Knowledge without transformation is just theology, and theology has no life. We've got to allow the knowledge that God gives us to transform us, to transform us from the inside out. We can't just have search out knowledge from the Lord without allowing it to transform us. We've got to not only be hearers of the word, but what? Doers of the word. Look at this, Matthew 16, 24 through 28. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. If you desire knowledge and you know that God is omniscient, meaning he's all-knowing, what do you do? Daily, you take up your cross, you deny yourself, and you follow him. That's the key. The key is to deny yourself daily. Verse 25, whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. It's one of the great paradoxes of the Bible is we humble ourselves, we give our life fully, completely surrender to him. We end, up we end up finding life in him. As we lose our life in Christ, we find life in him. For what profit is a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. We don't like to really pay attention to that part. But what we do in this life really does matter. It matters in the next life. We will be rewarded for the things that we do for God and the things that we don't do for him and what he's calling us to do. Verse 28, assuredly I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the son of man coming in his kingdom. Listen, disciples, discipleship happens when we point others to Jesus. I said this last week, we're not trying to make people I'm not trying to make people like me. I want to make people like Jesus. Each and every person is unique. You have a unique gifts, gifting set that the Lord has given you. You have a unique purpose that God has given you. I'm not trying to make anyone like me. I want them to be like Jesus. And as they discover Jesus, that's what true discipleship is. Discipleship happens when you learn to follow the Lord. You learn, it, we're going to lay, kind of lay this out, but it's through encouraging one another to spend time with Jesus, discovering who he is, and then growing personally in the development uh, of the Lord. And as we do that, that's true discipleship. True discipleship is encouraging one another. How are you in the word? To, uh, how, how, how have you been in the word this past week? How have you been in just in your family life? How, how have you been with even uh, the flow of, of fasting and prayer? Have you been doing that? That's when true discipleship happens. Allowing them to see Jesus. And to know discipleship, we, we, we put throughout this value last week, it's this, never stop. As disciples of Jesus, we will never stop growing in our relationship with him. We believe Jesus' best plan for this is discipleship. We will be disciples that make disciples. Again, what do we do? We never stop growing. We never stop pursuing the Lord. We never stop challenging one another so we can become disciples of Jesus. Disciples always make disciples disciples. So I want to end with this, Genesis 11. In this building season, I think this is a great example for us. In the Tower of Babel. Let's read this together. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. You might be thinking, Adam, don't you know the Tower of Babel didn't end very well? Yes, I do know. <laughs> and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower 
whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves. Listen, the people had one language, one speech. They came together in unity, but they had a blind spot, didn't they? What was their blind spot? They didn't recognize their dependency on Jesus. We can come together in unity. We can speak the same language and values, but we don't come together with a reliance on God. Watch what happens next. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them because they were unified. Verse 7, come, let us, let us go down. And they are confused their language that they, may not that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Because they built the tower, because they attempted to build this tower with their name for their own glory, although they were unified, although they had one speech, they had a desire to build, the Lord didn't bless it. He didn't bless their building. The work would not be finished. But what if a people came together who spoke the same language, who were unified, who only wanted to exalt the name of Jesus and to give them glory? You see, these people, they got the attention of God. But if we did it for the glory of God in our lives individually, but also for us corporately, what might happen? We're going to get the attention of heaven, and what's going to happen is the manifest presence of God will have a habitation in this house. So what I propose to you this morning is this. Let's not build it for our own glory, but only for His glory. Let's allow Him to build His house. What will happen? The gates of hell will not prevail against it. Listen, no matter what trial, no matter what tribulation, no matter what attack of the enemy comes against us, we can firmly say Psalm 91 is ours. We are hiding underneath the shadow of the Almighty as we build. I'm reminded of Nehemiah. As they built, they had a hammer in one hand and they had the sword in the other. As they fall off and they defended themselves, we will be a people who build for the glory of God in our lives individually and for our church corporately. Amen. We will allow him to build his church. We need all his wisdom. We need his knowledge. We need his understanding. For we have blind spots in our lives. You've got to recognize we've got blind spots. Lord, would you show us the ways in which we fall short, God? For Lord, we know that God, in our weakness, what happens? We are strong, right? In our weakness, we are strong. When we are poor, he is rich. Lord, we thank you this morning, God, that you're a I am God, that nothing is impossible for you, Jesus. Lord, we say, God, we will arise and build, but only with you.